You're listening to the Yoga Medicine Podcast. I'm your host, Tiffany Cruikshank. Our podcast brings you information and resources to enhance the therapeutic effects of your practice based on a deeper understanding of anatomy, physiology, and the integration of modern science and research with traditional practices and experiences. Join me and my co-hosts, Rachel Land and Katya Barch, as we dive into all things yoga, research, and wellness. The content of this podcast is not medical advice and is not meant to replace medical care. Please consult your healthcare provider to determine what is best for your unique healthcare needs. We are back. I've got Katya here with me today, and I'm so excited. We're going to talk about the fascia as a sensory organ. I think this is such important information, whether you're a healthcare provider or a body worker or a yoga teacher, really understanding this tissue that we use to discard and not really look at, and just how incredibly um, intelligent and perceptive this tissue can be and how important it is to keep in mind as we look at both body work and yoga practices, movement practices in general. And we're going to dive in and, and get right in there. <laughs> we're not going to mess around. So um, we're going to start by talking a little bit more about just some of the different senses that we find in the body, the, the ability to sense. And I'm going to let Katya take it from here. Yeah, let's jump right in. Um, <laughs> sensing our world, sensing us is um, so important, obviously. And I think many of us or most of us, all of us know about our general senses like sight and your hearing, your taste and stuff like that. And uh, we grow up like shaping those senses. And today we want to talk about two more senses, so to say. So some people say we have a sixth sense and a seventh sense. And um, so those senses, you know, we sometimes call them exteroception because you use your eyes, you use your hearing, you use your nose to sense everything that is outside of your body. So you see the world, you hear it and all of that. And we would call that exteroception. And then we do not only perceive the world around us, but we also perceive us, hopefully. Um, and the sixth sense I was referring to, we can call proprioception. Many of you may have heard that. That is the sense um, of you in space. So sensing your own self in space, sensing your joint position, sensing how active your muscles are. And that's related to your own body, obviously. And then we have a seventh sense as well, which would be to tune into your body even more internally. And we would call that interoception which has been on, on Vogue for a while. So we kind of have this threefold senses, the exteroception outside of our body, proprioception, our bodies in space, and then interoception looking into ourselves or perceiving what's coming from inside of the body. And what we want to talk today about is how that relates to the fascial system and of course also to the yoga practice, right? Yeah. And I think what's so interesting is just how incredibly dense this innervation is in the fascia um, and, and comparing it to some different other, other parts of the body too. Mm -hmm. And we haven't, we, we didn't know that a couple of years ago. So that information is still rather fresh. And we know that especially the proprioception, so sensing yourself in space and interoception, so sensing what's inside the body, that those two are really related to the fascial system. So we do have those sensors in the body, in the periphery of our body. And those sensors, those receptors send information to our central nervous system, to the brain. And we, we need that information. And the fascial tissues, like you just said, are really dense with those nerve endings or receptors, sensors. Um, and that's rather new information. It's not brand new, but it's rather new. Well, and it's changing really quickly because I remember it was only like a year or two ago when it was such big news that we learned that there were about a hundred million, right? Um, nerve endings in the, in the fascia. And then all of a sudden just this, was it a oh year? I'm COVID is changing my time sense. <laughs> I think that was a few years ago. And then just a year or two ago, we expanded that a lot, right? To mm -hmm. 250 million. Um, 
Was it, it was something like that, right? Was it five years ago? Yeah, I think 2017, a colleague here from Germany, from Leipzig, Martin Grunwald, described in one of his books, um, Homo Hapticus, really cool, cool name for a book, um, those 100 million. And he described that we have those nerve endings, 100 million nerve endings in our deeper fascia, in the dense fascia. And then very recently, um, I think 20... 20, I want to say, or 2019. I'm not sure either, but rather recently. Um, Carla Stecco and Robert Schleip were involved in calculations where they um, added the superficial fascia to that. So not only the dense fascia, but also the superficial fascia holds a lot of nerve endings. And if you take those two together, you end up um, with about 17% of your body weight. And those 17% of your body weight hold about 250 million nerve endings. And that's as much as any organ has in the body. So if you take that number, that points to the fact that, that the fascial tissues are really the richest sensory organ that we have. Mm-hmm. I, I know. I remember with, with the 100 million, it was such a big deal too. And we mm-hmm. used to have in our manual that fascia was the, you know, the richest, uh, after the skin, <laughs> it was in parentheses. Now we can like take that out <laughs> because it is one of the, it is the most neurologically dense organ in the body really. Exactly. So if you want to put that into perspectives and you're all for numbers, the skin, I believe, has about 200 million nerve endings. And the eye is often referred to as the the richest sensory organ from those classical senses. And that has about 126 million nerve endings. So that's kind of the relation. It's really a lot of nerve endings in the fascia. That's a lot for a tiny little, <laughs> little eyeball. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the, our eyesight is really um, very complex too, and probably good for another for another talk on here or uh, oh, for for yeah. in depth study. But the fascial system is quite um, fascinating too in that terms. I feel many rich conversations to come. <laughs> dense, <laughs> neurologically <laughs> dense conversations to come. Um. Well, let, you want to talk about the receptors next and the different types of receptors in the fascia? Because I know there's there's a few very specific ones that we find a lot in the fascia. We have a lot of different nerve receptors in our body, as you could imagine. And the fascia has some very, maybe some familiar ones if you've looked at this research before. Yeah. Uh, maybe before we head into the details of those different sensors, different receptors, just to to really give this gravitas and to to make the audience understand what it means that we have those working receptors. Um, Our brain really relies upon that info from the body, as we already said, from the periphery. Um, On that input, sensing your body is really essential. And when it comes to proprioception, sensing yourself in in space, your brain puts together that info from from the fascia, from the receptors there, from your sight, from your vestibular system, so that you know where you are in space and you don't fall down. And some of you may have heard about the quite fascinating example of Ian Waterman. There has been a book about him. There has been um, a documentary about him. And he's a person who has lost his proprioception. So I believe it was a virus or so that kind of killed off his receptors or his proprioceptive uh, senses. And he cannot rely upon those receptors anymore uh, and on those nerves. So when he cannot see and does not have that feedback from the eyes, um, does not have mm, that anticipation or coordination that he uses from his past memory, he would actually not be able to move. So he would fall down. There's uh, in the documentary they did about him quite a nice example. When they put out the light, he would fall down because he has to rely on his sight so much on that exteroception. And uh, so proprioception is really essential for us. It's not just sometimes we think the brain is like the mastermind of all things. And yes, we do need 
information from the brain to be sent to our muscles, to our tissues, to our body. But it's really about sensing too. It's getting that feedback from the body back to the brain, to the central nervous system that is vital in all of our movements. And I just wanted to, yeah, mention that up front, that up front. Well, and even so much as not even just the light, but having to like look down and actually see your foot moving to be able to step into the, you know, the place that you're looking to step into, like in a yoga practice, we take so much of that for granted. You know, we're always moving and and though our eyes are open and we feel like we can see more just because our eyes are open, we're not looking down and watching our foot move. We're not telling our foot where to step and seeing it. We're actually feeling that. And that is you know, a good, a good kind of awareness of just how much pro perception goes into play because there's so much that we do in a yoga practice in our lives that we're not looking at. Um, but mm-hmm. that we're really relying on this perception of, of feeling where our body is in space. Exactly. And if you've ever participated in a blindfolded practice, you will have mm-hmm. to have used those receptors that we're about to talk in a minute. Otherwise you would have fallen down as well. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Even more so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if we want to look at those receptors, um, maybe to explain to you how you can imagine them, we have sensory nerves. So those those are the nerves that take the information from the body back to the central nervous system. And they have they end somewhere in the tissues, oftentimes the fascial tissues. And at the end of those nerves, we have nerve endings. And when it comes to proprioception, which we will focus on here mainly, um, there are specific endings, specific receptors on those nerves, on the ends of those nerves um, that respond to mechanical input. And those are especially important when, when it comes to perceiving ourselves in space. Yes, all these brilliant mechanoreceptors. I love it. And a few that are very specific, um, a few that are very specific to the fascia. I know we we love to talk about if you've taken some of our courses, we talk a lot about these. Um, and the, the first, I think, is probably the least applicable to yoga, but still applicable. The Piscini receptors are really interesting because they're the ones that are responding to rapid changes. And so we think of these more with jumping or bouncing or vibrating. We were talking about, I know last year I gave out a few, a few of the gifts I gave out, um, for the holidays were vibrating foam rollers, which I think I was really, I go through, we all go through phases and some of these tools that we like to use more or less sometimes, but I really like them because you can target a big chunk of connective tissue at once. Um, but what we're looking at here is these Piscini receptors that are being activated with that quicker movement, which could be vibration. It could be jumping. It could be bouncing. Um, yeah. Yeah. Or yeah, some, some forms of yoga, I think consciously or not do include movements that are maybe a bit more speaking to those. So those, uh, receptors, they really, they, they shout out hooray when you do all those things that Tiffany just mentioned, but also in Kundalini yoga, for instance, we have those sudden directional movements. One that I like is when you, when you're seated and you just have your hands on your shoulders and then you do those fast rotations with the upper body and you switch gear quite quickly from side to side. And it becomes that maybe even ballistic sort of stretch, if you wish, and uh, that rotational movement those would be one that those receptors love. So they rapidly change or they need that rapid movement, those directional changes so that they respond. And um, yeah, as you're mentioning, sometimes we we do find them in the yoga practice, but those other devices such as massage devices or vibrational foam rollers really speak to those um, receptors as well. Maybe even simple Kapalabhati breathing, jumps, hopping, anything that's kind of quickly changing. So you can imagine there's a lot of different scenarios in the fitness realm that are going to be targeting these Piscini receptors when you're moving more quickly or jumping or hopping. Um, but I love, again, the, the vibration is another one too, and it's used a lot a lot more in the bodywork realm now, those um, 
what are those, uh, the Theraguns, right? With the little mm-hmm. the vibration tools are so popular now. And I, I think can be a really interesting tool too, as a, as a body worker or self body work <laughs> as well, which is wonderful. We're a big fan of having tools you can use on yourself mm-hmm. or give to your patients or students to use on themselves. So I think a really interesting category to give a nod to here. Um, the next one, the Rafini endings are a big one that we look at in yoga, right? These are the ones that are more slowly kind of the, this is the yin and the yang. We have the, the quickly adapting ones. Now we've got the slowly adapting ones. Um, and you know, I think we think of these really quickly in something like a, a yin practice where we're moving in slowly, we're staying, there's obviously some body work implications, right? Um, yeah, and they also really love shear loading. So in body work, when we try to move our different tissue layers um, relative to each other, um, creating that kind of shear tension there. And we also do that when we do self myofascial release, right? When we try to pin down a ball or a roller and move on the device, then creating those shear loads, that's also something that they are really in love with and respond to. I think that one's a good one to feel sometimes. And this one, whether you're watching us on YouTube or listening, if you just go ahead and grab a hold of your forearm, I think of this like lobster claw uh, between my <laughs> four fingers and my thumb where I can actually grab onto it. Um, you can feel that you can move the skin around. Everyone can kind of sense that feeling there. But if I actually use my fingers and just try and pin the skin down, now if I just move my wrist or my fingers, I've got tissues, I've got muscles that are moving underneath there. So what we're doing here with a myofascial ball or our fingers is pinning down the superficial fascia, which is attached to the skin with my fingers. As I pin the skin down, I pin that superficial fascia down. And then as I move the nearby joint, um, I, you can kind of visualize the muscle tissue moving underneath it. And that's our deep fascia layer, which is connected to the muscle tissue there. Um, and then it, it creates this movement between the layers here, which is that shearing that we're looking at is that, that movement between the layers, which is so important for so many things. I feel like we could do a whole episode on <laughs> just that, but yeah, there's one thing. The shearing is a big one. Yeah. And it's not, as you're just describing, it's not just the biomechanical um, implications or biomechanical effects, but also sensory one by specifically targeting those Rufinia receptors. Yeah. And it's, it's important that they're able to move there, right? Because then it sends a different kind of information or lack of information if they're not able to glide and send information about that gliding back up to the brain. So that, that capacity to continue that gliding is so important or maintain that gliding is so important for this, this sensory system that it's able to capture that information associated with the gliding too, right? And I think just generally, um, in, in, in the case of the Ruffinis, it's that gliding. In the case of the Passinis, it's that vibrational quality or the sudden onset of a movement. But when we think about why, why are we doing this, it's, it's about getting that information up to the brain and having that rich conversation between the tissue and the central nervous system, between the fascia, as we talk about it today, and the brain. Um, so all of these qualities you want to have in your movement practice, be it yoga or or otherwise, so that you basically have that communication training between the periphery, between the body and and the brain. I think that's where that's what's important about all of these uh, receptors that we're discussing today. Well, and, and if we if we back up and just think about the proprioceptive information, there is this kind of newer understanding. I, I feel like we've talked about it on here. I know I feel like I've talked about it a lot in our trainings, but just this idea that if the body's not getting enough of that proprioceptive information, that it starts to amplify the nociceptive information, which is ultimately potentially translated into pain in the brain at some point. Those are those extreme changes in temperature, pressure, or chemicals there. Um, So we know how important and precious, and I I love that you put that in there, Katya, because I think it's important as we talk about these different receptors that we remember how important the proprioceptive information is not just for our capacity to move and sense the world and, and move really articulately, 
but then also, you know, this new understanding that this proprioceptive information is competing with the nociceptive information in the spinal cord and that dorsal horn of the spinal cord. And so, um, when we don't have enough of that proprioceptive information, the body starts to put out a magnifying glass toward that nociceptive information and amplify it. And so another reason why, stimulating some of these receptors, the Pacini and the Ruffini are really important um, because we want to be able to help regulate potentially, and in a lot of instances, potentially regulate, regulate pain or absolutely or pain. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like uh, when I talk about this, I like um, the image of driving in your car and you have the radio on and then the channel is not exactly in in space and spot and you get this this cracking sound and the cracking sound always appears to be so much louder than the actual song that's on the radio so you really want to fine tune the station so that you get the actual song in all its clarity and have that improved communication if you want to translate it again to our case have that clear signal because the the song that's playing is just so much nicer than all the the those noisy sounds um, that appear so much louder and that would be the the example of pain or the comparison to pain in your in your story that you said before so that's that's that. an image i like to compare that to yeah absolutely i'm fully with you on that yeah <laughs> So the Ruffini endings are really important um, in addition to all of the, the different types of receptors that we're talking about in the fascia. But you can imagine these in um, any kind of static stretching, like a yin capacity, in a body work um, scenario where you're kind of moving more slowly, this kind of more melting type of pressure or, or an MFR if you do self-MFR. Um, you know, I think it's really important as, as teachers, I know we have a lot of teachers who listen. Um, I feel like it's really common. People are very familiar with MFR and they come in and when you start teaching it, a lot of times the hard part is everyone's like trying to like move all over and scribble and kind of get everything. And they're really trying to dig in there. And it's, it's hard to get people to just kind of want to stay with it and melt into it and have like a really what I think of as a more meaningful conversation a lot of times with the tissues when I'm able to stay with it than if I'm trying to like get everything and get in deeper and really push in there. And I think these Ruffini receptors, you know, they bring that to life is how important it is to have this kind of meaningful conversation where we can listen and sense and stay with some of these areas. And maybe as we stay, we're able to relax and sink in a little deeper, or maybe we're just moving more slowly with that myofascial ball. So this, this kind of slower, deeper sensing and feeling, I think is a really important, um, important way of activating these receptors when you're using, whether it's your hands or myofascial balls or foam rollers or whatever kind of tools you like to use, um, that it has a really important place. Yeah. When we, in, in manual therapy, we also, um, call this a listening touch when we want to talk to the Ruffini. So it's not only the feeling, the sensing, the listening too. So all the senses back in there. Um, Yeah. Yeah. And this one is also really important because it also stimulates that parasympathetic response, which we'll talk more about the autonomic nervous system in another episode, but I think just an important little bookmark to add there because I think that's a pretty a pretty important detail there. And I think a lot of people have probably sensed that in their own body as you're doing MFR. I know a lot of our listeners do a lot of MFR. Um but as you stay with some of these and as you're moving more slowly, I know I feel a lot more of that than if I'm, you know, there's definitely times where I'm moving around and maybe, you know, doing more movement associated with it or, or other things. Um, you know, if I'm able to kind of stay with it and sense it and listen, like you said, it definitely has more of that relaxation response to it. So. All right. So the next one, we've got a big category now. <laughs> All those muscle spindles, that's a big one. Um, and and they're is, complex too. Yeah. And basically all movements, right? The muscle spindles are constantly listening when we're moving. They're a little less specific, I think of, right? 
Yeah, they are. And that's also related to their architecture. They are kind of embedded in the intramuscular fascial sheets. So in, in the in the fascial socks that kind of hold various muscle cells or muscle fibers together. So they're very closely related to all muscle movements and also their threshold to respond is really low. Um, only it takes about three grams or so, I believe, to trigger muscle spindles. So that's very little force. So they continuously respond to any movement and send that information up towards the brain. Mm. So less specific, less about certain movements, less about um, certain things, but even just as we're stepping into a pose, as we're staying and breathing in a pose, as we're transitioning, um, as we're coming into a yin posture, it's kind of always there listening. Those are the, the receptors that are kind of paying attention to all of the different little changes um, in the connective tissue, especially. Yeah, very subtle and sensitive, these guys. Yeah. And then the Golgi endings are are pretty vast. They have a lot of interesting implications, um, but definitely responding to to tension. I know these were often called the Golgi tendon organs, and then recent, and then later on, we found out that they're not just in the tendons. So, you know, people have tried to take away that and look at the look at them in a broader context too. I think. Yes, exactly, and they um, they also kind of enable that communication between agonist and antagonist muscles. So that's also where they come into play, not only in the tendons, but also they can be found in the fascial sheets between muscles. So the intramuscular septa. So they also kind of coordinate that movement between muscle groups a little bit, or they're definitely involved in that too. I know that the classic illustration um, is that of, you know, you pick up a weight that's too heavy that you can't lift. And this is the response to to kind of let it go and drop it. Um, so it's triggering that relaxation response to under under tension. So there's also a bit of that um, relaxation response with this one. Um, what else did we want to say yeah. about those? I feel like those are so bad. It's almost hard to talk about them. <laughs> <laughs> They're so vast. That's true. What I find is an interesting quality also related to the yoga practices that they have been found to um, be involved in sensing of heaviness. So let's say we're in Shavasana and we're cueing someone to actually feel that heaviness of muscle or heaviness of body, the Golgi seem to be involved in that as well. So I find that in our discipline in, in yoga, that's something that we actively speak to in certain practices, be it yin yoga or shavasana. So that's also a fascinating little piece about them that I love. I love this because for me, one thing that's really important in a yoga practice, and I know, you know, th there's so many things we can focus on. So I definitely focus on it in some classes more than others. But one thing I think that's really important is that that check-in period, especially with myofascial release, but even in yoga pose. So, you know, maybe you do a yoga pose and then you come into Shavasana. I remember one of my trips to India that I, I was studying with a teacher who was, who was near where we were and every pose he would take us into Shavasana. And I really think there's something to that. I mean, obviously it might not be something you do every time. There's, there's so many things that we can, um, so many tools in a yoga practice, but that listening is such a big part of it. And so this is just one part of it. A lot of times when we're in Shavasana, maybe after a myofascial release technique or after a yoga pose, I'm cueing people into those things. So you know, is, does one arm feel longer? You know, you'll do myofascial release on one arm and not the other. And it's really common that there's this, this very typical asymmetry. So that proprioceptive awareness, now we've enhanced that proprioception within these fascial tissues and my arm actually feels longer, or maybe it feels like it's more rotated. But when I look up, I pull my head up and I look, my hands are actually in the same exact position, even though one feels like it's totally different. And the heaviness is part of that too, is like, does one arm feel heavier. So sometimes it's these senses of, of one arm feels longer or more rotated or one side feels heavier. Sometimes for me, it just feels more vibrant, more awake, more aware. And I think talking people into these things, you know, we tend to think of this, this Shavasana or, you know, these check-in periods as being kind of like a neutralizing pose, which 
probably it is to some extent, but it's also this information collection period now where your body gets you, your brain gets to take all that information and, and work that you've done. And I think of it often as like the, the processing, the integration, the recalibration. Now my body is kind of listening and responding to that. Um, and so I, I feel like these are easy to look over easy to gloss over in a yoga practice because we want to get to the next myofascial release technique. But I think this understanding of the sensory information and the sensory system brings to life just how important those periods of check-in are. Yeah. It's just like after dinner, we need to digest. And after movement, we need to let the nervous system digest as well. And that, that tuning in is, is basically that to me, it's kind of digesting your movement session. I love and, that. uh, yeah, I think that that feels really can feel really enhanced or just, um, yeah, like that nice song on the radio when you suddenly feel like it's it's playing loud and clear and, and you just enjoy that sound of your own body. I love that. All right. So let's talk about the free nerve endings. Another one that's really hard to talk about since they're so broad and vast and still so, so poorly understood, I think really, because they are so broad and vast. Um, but this is a huge category of receptors in the body and in the the fascia as well. So an important one to include here. Yeah, the the ones that are most represented, um, so just in number, and then also in function, many of those free nerve endings have different functions. So they do not only respond to one stimulus, but they may respond to pain and to temperature and to touch. So to different things, which makes them harder to understand, but also more fascinating in, in their function uh, and, and what different types of things they can actually accomplish. Yeah, so that they, they can kind of change and be adaptable according to the situation, which is is so I think brilliant, <laughs> but also leaves a lot of a lot for us to continue to learn about these. So, um, you know, obviously these will be activated in a lot of different ways. I think in a yoga context, um, a little harder to be specific here. Yeah, they are. Um, I mean, what we can say and what we can translate into the practice is that they are more related to the extracellular matrix in the fascia. So, and because of that position or that architecture, they do respond well to shear loading again, just like we said with the Ruffinis, but also generally to all kinds of um, stretches because they, some of them don't really need a lot of mechanical input to respond. So they're going to be a little bit in, in everything again, like the spindles um, to, they will respond to various different inputs. And these were really the ones I was referring to before is these, these, uh, receptors that can change in response. So if they're not getting enough of that proprioceptive information, they're really amping up that nociceptive information too. So, um, I think that's, uh, you know, an important area to look at because this is such a huge, huge number. Uh, there's such a huge number of these, uh, free nerve endings in particular. And what is really interesting, what I love about this, um, this kind of proprioceptive information competing with that nociceptive information is, uh, a, a study I remember from Lormar mostly, a uh, scientist who, I really love and respect out of Australia. There was a paper, I think it was in 2008, where he was um, looking at how this mindfulness was also a big part of that. So they looked at um, patients who they had, who they were, they were using some sort of stimulus to the tissues and they looked at some who were also reading a book. (laughs) So they were kind of tuning out versus those who were asked to kind of give feedback on the work that they were doing. So there's this mindfulness, they're able to kind of discriminate between the different points that they were stimulating. I think this was on the back. Um, But what they found was that the people who were kind of tuning out or reading a book didn't actually show any responses to what they were doing, the tactile stimulation they were doing, um, versus the people who, uh, were actually giving this discriminating feedback to be able to be really specific to what they were feeling. So it was a pretty, 
I feel like it was a pretty big study at the time. I know this one's been on my, um, on my list. I talk about a lot <laughs> ever since because it really is just amplifying the importance of, um, paying attention and, and, and probably has a lot of implications though, not totally directly to this, but I think a lot of implications to mindful movement and the importance of being able to amplify all of these, um, all of these messages in the sensory system or en enhance it through our mindfulness, our ability to pay attention, um, which is, I think, an easy one to, to sense in your own body too. Yeah. And also our ability to willingly kind of zoom in and zoom out, right. Or willingly, um, tune into, to those sensory qualities of the tissues. I think that's important too, related to proprioception, also related to interoception. And that's where those free nerve endings will come into play again in the interoceptive part, because um, we also have those free nerve endings, not only in the fascial tissues of our muscles or of, of our movement system, but also in the viscera and our abdominal organs. And um, there, this quality of tuning into our organs, into the very deepest part of our body will also be very important or also plays a big mm -hmm. role in that context. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about where do we find these receptors? You want to kick it off with the superficial fascia? Yeah. Um, so the superficial fascia, so the fascial tissues right under the skin, mainly, um, they are really very, very richly innervated with those mechanoreceptors we just talked about with the Ruffinis, with the Passinis, um, also with free nerve endings. So, and within the superficial fascia or within the superficial connective tissue, it's again, the more superficial layers where we find those receptors. We also find a lot of them in the skin. So in the very superficial layers here, which I find quite interesting, um, the deeper layers of the superficial fascia don't have so many of them. And what is uh, also from an application standpoint really interesting about that is that we find those Ruffinis and the Passinis in spaces where we have those um, transitional loading zones, we can call them. So in any spaces where it's rather easy to let the skin glide and slide from side to side. So that's where we find a lot of these um, receptors. And that's also one line of argument how taping of the skin may actually work so it that might actually be a sensory thing that by taping your skin and having a little tag on the skin when you tape the skin or tape the superficial tissues underneath that you speak to those receptors that are in those layers and they then trigger some sort of response or um, lead to some sort of response there. I love that. I used to use the kinesio tape so much. I feel like it's been a lot. It's been like 15 years since I've really used it a lot, but I love the kinesio taping and I think it, it can be helpful. Obviously I, it doesn't, it doesn't always fix the mechanical issues, of course, because there's other things that need to be looked at there. But for those who are listening, who aren't familiar, keep in mind too, in a very rudimentary sense, the superficial fascia is that layer between the skin and the muscle. So you can imagine on some parts of your body, like maybe your scalp, um, you can usually, you can usually still find it there. It can be harder to find if you're dissecting. Um, but you can imagine on something like the hips or the abdomen, it will be a thicker layer potentially because it does also include some adipose layer. Um, but the deep fascial layer is going to be what creates that container for not only the muscles, but the nerves and the blood vessels and is a, is a different quality. So the superficial fascia is that more loose connective tissue versus the deep is a very strong, dense type of connective tissue, which wraps around and through the muscles, um, as well as the bones, the organs, it's kind of like what we often talk about as that saran wrap layer, that cling wrap layer is that deep fascia layer um, versus the superficial fascia, which is that looser kind of between the skin and the muscles, even though we know there's other areas where we have loose connective tissue in those gliding zones as well. 
Um, but that's an easy way to break it down is just thinking of the superficial under the skin and the, the deep as kind of those layers around the muscles. Yeah. And that deeper tissue or that those deeper layers, that unitard layers there, they actually do not have as many of these receptors, um, which we may have thought so previously, but um, it's more the superficial layers that hold these receptors. And there are quite new studies last two, three years that have shown this, which I find interesting. Um, but what's also interesting is that in the deeper tissues, there are certain spots in the body where we have a lot of movement or where we need a lot of precision, where we do find those receptors again. And that makes sense because when we need to be precise in our movement, we need to have a lot of sensory feedback from the body. And that's, for instance, um, in your hands, so the palmar fascia and the wrists and also the plantar fascia and the ankles. So in the wrists and in the ankles, you have these fascial Socks. So if you have a fascial wrist sweatband and you have a fascial um, tennis sock, so to say, on your ankle that holds all the tendons in, but also is richly equipped with those receptors we've been talking about with the Ruffinis, with the Passinis and so on. And that makes sense because we, we want to tune into those movements or we need to be very precise there. And that's where we find a lot of them. And I, I love this because I know Gil Headley loves talking about the superficial fascia and it kind of gets a, it gets a negative rap because it is that area. Um, if you've done dissections, it's the area we're just trying to remove and get rid of and get it out of the way so that we can see those beautiful, the body world's exhibits and a lot of these beautiful anatomic illustrations where we can see the parts we want to. It's also the layer that holds a lot of the adipose tissue. So there's kind of a, a negative perception with that. But when we look at the superficial fascial layer, it's such a important and brilliant and neurologically dense information system that's sending us so much sensory information. So that's so precious to both how we relate to the world around us, how we move, how we sense, how we feel, how we experience the world around us. Um, so it's just, it's such a precious layer and hopefully maybe just that sometimes it's just the understanding, the education that helps change our perception of things, um, that this layer is, is such an important and precious one for, for many other reasons as well, too. We know that the adipose layer is important for endocrine function and, um, so many things. Uh, so hopefully that just brings another, another precious awareness <laughs> to the forefront of your brain too for this layer. Definitely. It's like literally what is kind of separating us from the world. And it makes sense that it's kind of like how we perceive the world or that's kind of like that transitional layer, maybe even um, with that rich sensory information. Yeah. I love that. And then we've got the, the thoracal lumbar fascia, which is a really neurologically dense, deep fascia layer too, which is an interesting one, I think, to talk about too, briefly. Yeah, it's, it's definitely interesting. Um, it's also still researched a lot. Um, rather recent studies from 2019, I believe, from a group in Heidelberg in Germany uh, around Siegfried Menze. If you're interested in all of that stuff, look him up. He has uh, great studies on the thoracolumbar fascia innervation. They did actually find that they didn't find any Ruffini or Passini um, bodies in the thoracolumbar fascia. So that thick fascial sheath in your low back, which was really surprising to them. They did find free nerve endings, so they can have proprioceptive function too, but this may also point to a nociceptive function of the low back, but that was rather surprising to them. We have to keep in mind though, that they only looked rather close to the spine. So more to the side or more laterally to the spine, there might be more of these receptors that we've been talking about, but close to the spine, there were surprisingly little in number or small in number. So we still have to learn a lot there. It's such a great area of study too. I think anything within the, the fascial world, you know, I think 10 or 20 years from now, we're going to have so much more information and keep adding to it, but it's pretty brilliant to see how far we've come just in the past 10 years. Yeah. And also how we have incorporated these things in our yoga practice without even thinking about it. So we do try to keep our low backs, um, 
gliding and sliding to create that shearing quality um, to maybe not provoke that nociceptive input from the free nerve endings there. We know that and we've been doing that in yoga without knowing it for decades or what I like about the, the layers that we talked about before, like the wrist and ankle retinacula. Like when you think about it, when you come out of Shavasana and you start moving your fingers and your toes and your wrists and your ankles, you kind of kick off that proprioceptive awareness and you literally come back into your body because you sense your body more when you come out of Shavasana, when you cue stuff like that. I just love having that puzzle piece that explains why that makes even more sense, even though we've been doing that anyway. Um, the whole true for the thoracolumbar fascia, but also for these retinacula, for instance. I love that. Yeah. Uh, where, where do you want to go next? Do you want to head over to interoception or do you feel like... Do you feel good about that one? Yeah, I think we should talk about interoception at least for a little bit as we've been talking about sensing the world, sensing us in space, sensing our deepest selves. And we already talked about the free nerve endings, so that's where they come into play again um, because we have those interstitial nerves, we call them in the fascia too, that do not only respond to mechanical input, to movement, but they also can give us... Um, signals about warmth about um yeah hunger. sense of heaviness hunger soreness muscle activity again that sense of lightness or heaviness is also not only a proprioceptive sensation but also an interoceptive one or even um the alienation of body parts or that sense of belonging that we sometimes may use or cue in, in the yoga practice too, that all comes or can come from, from those nerve endings too. Mm, I, I love this and, one too, because it used to be really thought of as our visceral awareness, you know, the mm -hmm. gurgling of your stomach or, you know, all those visceral sensations. Mm -hmm. But now we've really expanded the understanding of this to include touch and sensory information and really everything that relates to informing our, our state, our body state and, and how we feel and that sense of safety and how we experience the world. So I think it's, it's really interesting to see our definition of interoception expand and then this awareness this idea of, of body awareness being one of both proprioception and interoception you know so we kind of smush those together when we talk about body awareness but we're really including when we talk about body awareness that idea of interoception as as a part of it a good part of it yeah, and it's really two different things because those information pieces, the proprioceptive information and the sensory um, information really end up in different parts of the brain uh, without going too much into detail there. But they, they are definitely, they have a different pathway to the brain and the part of the brain that's related to interoception or we talk about in context with interoception, the insular cortex is really a special one and holds different functions than um, just the proprioceptive part, which um, yeah, is somewhere else in the brain. So yeah, those definitely have a, their own, their own story to it. And, you know, it's really all of these things, the proprioception and the interoception are all about feeling into that awareness in the body. So, you know, I think in a yoga practice, it's those questions we ask that are so valuable here versus the, the talking and information can sometimes really bring us out of this awareness. Like when we start to talk about maybe angles or shapes or or just talking too much in a yoga practice, we bring them out of that body awareness and the, with the talking. And so what we want to be able to do is keep in mind, obviously there's a place for everything. Alignment and cues and anatomy are so valuable. That mechanical information is so important, but that when we start to focus on one part of the practice, we do lose some of the other parts of the practice, which is, which is fine because there's a place for everything, but that this interoceptive information is really driven by the noticing, the listening, the, um, the feeling experience, the sensing experience. So, um, yeah. Questions. And if you're, if you're a teacher, I think, um, that's something to keep in mind too, especially if you're teaching myofascial release and we all have been in the situation, probably if we've been in a myofascial release class and you, you hit those spots that are just 
you know, they tell this rich story and you want to share that story that your body tells you. And I think in myofascial release, for instance, when you work with athletes, suddenly everyone is very keen on sharing their body experience, but there's also really value in encouraging your students to, to not share at this moment and just to keep to themselves for that mm. piece of time or for that moment. Um, even though we have that, um, yeah, we have that in us that we really want to share our experience there. I think it's also to what I'm often talking about is this idea of, of not having to understand it either, of, of not having to talk through the, the story behind it or interpret it, but really being able to stay in that sensing and awareness. Because a lot of times as, as students, I know as human beings, you know, we sense that thing and then we're like, oh gosh, is that something wrong? Do I need to change it? Have I not eaten enough today? Is my blood sugar low? Or, you know, like you're thinking about all these things and trying to dissect it and discern it. And that's also potentially taking us out out of that interoceptive awareness where we're just being and feeling and sensing. And so there's something really powerful and precious to just allowing your students or yourself to be in that awareness. And it's kind of funny because as a human, you're just like, you know, laying on the ground and listening to your stomach and, and, and sensing those <laughs> sensations can, can feel kind of silly until we really understand the information behind it. And you listen to this podcast and you're like, oh, wow, that's actually really important and precious. And maybe you can drop a few little tidbits in class and then <laughs> Zip it. <laughs> I, that's why I love the questions because then it's up to you to investigate and decide what's real for you, what you sense, what you feel, and um, allow yourself to be in that in that awareness too. Yeah, but what I want to mention here as well, um, I do love that we include those interceptive tidbits maybe in our practice or that encourage, encouragement to tune into our practice. And I also strongly believe that this um, differentiates us from many other movement practices or fitness practices. Mm. But we also now know that there is a little bit or there can be a little bit too much interoception. So there are certain um, health related diseases or dysfunctions where we know that interoception doesn't work perfectly. Let's put it like that. So that can be too little interoceptive awareness, but it can also be too much interoceptive awareness. So um, we know with anxiety or depression, for instance, that can also be too much interoceptive listening. Um, so it has to be, or we, sh we should look for that balance again, because we've been talking about conversations and communication with the tissues, but like a monologue, uh, is not the the best version of a conversation probably and it's the same with that intercept interceptive tuning in to our bodies i believe and my understanding with the anxiety was that it, it's not so much that it's too much interception but my our body is not understanding that and interpreting it correctly it's like the wires are getting crossed there's all this interceptive information coming on in but it's not being properly read or uh, interpreted and that there's kind of like a mismatch there versus in, in maybe depression where there's uh, less of that interoceptive awareness potentially. Is that, is that your understanding too, or is that? Um, so there can, different things can go wrong. There can go wrong. Things can go wrong at the receptor end of things. Things can go on, can go wrong on the pathway from the receptors to the brain. And then things can go wrong. Um, when we do digest that information in the brain and with different types of disorders that are related to interoceptive dysregulations, different things go wrong. So um, interoceptive dysfunctions, let's call it, let's call them that, um, have also been correlated with um, eating disorders, for instance, or ir irritable bowel syndrome. And what goes wrong there is something different than in anxiety or in depression. So um, without looking at all the little yeah. stations where something can go wrong, there can go, it, it's different parts of the whole equation think that can be out of balance there. Well, I guess my point is for people listening, I think if I heard that statement and, and I know, I think everyone's experienced anxiety at some point, whether that's a diagnosed condition or just an experience of anxiety, um, to hear that and think too much interoception might make you, 
nervous to do these. And I know for myself as a practitioner and someone who's worked with a lot of students who have, have uh, dealt with anxiety, I find for, for most people, though, you know, obviously I, I almost find that in depression, it can be more of an issue because now I'm drawing them into that internal awareness, but the anxiety, I feel like, again, this is just talking from my experience with people, not as, not a, a scientific perspective that these interoceptive practices, so <clears throat> interoceptive practices where focusing on this internal awareness can be a really great way for people with anxiety to help um, uncross some of those lines because they have so much of that interoceptive awareness that tends, and again, this is my interpretation of it, is tend to be kind of crossing here. And now I'm starting to kind of straighten those connections out a little bit more or maybe <laughs> maybe find some um, cohesion or, or continuity there potentially within the system um, to help with that. So I think what I'm hearing from you too, is that there's these interoceptive dysfunctions where there may be too little interoceptive information, or it may be not, um, communicating properly or being interpreted properly. But a lot of these interoceptive dysfunctions like IBS and eating disorders and anxiety and depression. And I think even some people put autism in there and PTSD in there and OCD in there and things like that. Um, can be really enhanced through or supported, right, through um, interoceptive practices. So simple practices where we're listening and paying attention um, versus things like mechanical issues like lower back pain where we really need to look at proprioception, mechanical inputs potentially. Yes, definitely. And I think we don't know a lot or we don't know everything about all of these conditions and what exactly um, is going on there. There's still a lot to be researched there. Um, I want to draw on one of the things that you said, though. I absolutely believe that having um, interoceptive practices in your bag when you do have anxiety or depression is very valuable. But as always, it's about keeping... Um, keeping that healthy balance, I do believe, not from a scientific uh, standpoint, but from my own experience teaching or um, experience with people that have anxiety, I do actually also believe that there is such a thing as tuning into your body too much. Um, say, just a very quick example, say you have that, you have that spot on your skin there and that just turned up recently and now it starts to itch. And now every time you look there, it itches. And now you think like, oh my God, I, I'm, I feel this spot all the time. Maybe there's something wrong there. And suddenly I notice that little bit itching day in, day out, 24 hours a day, um, seven days a week. And I'm, I'm really getting anxious about this. Um, so it's maybe a mo bit more um, specifically related to a, to a sensation in the body and, and the, the things I project onto that sensation or relate to that sensation. But I do believe, believe that there are cases where we can tune in a little bit too much too, yeah. and we can get lost in there. So I think it's about the ability to tune into the body and tune into all of these sensations, but not get lost in them. And I think that can happen as well. I just wanted to point that out. And I don't think we need to be anxious about applying interoceptive yeah. practices. Definitely not. But um, I think we can, there, there can be such a thing. I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up because I totally agree. And I think that, I think there's a little difference here. We do talk about this in the meditation training too, because it is potentially a contraindication or something you can run into. I think especially with people with diagnosed mental health disorders, always working with a, a healthcare provider and, and getting information from them too, and making sure that we're not trying to replace things like talk therapy, which are so important and uh, mental health professionals. But I think also, you know, when we look at it in a, in a yoga or meditation scenario, there's a, there, there can be a difference between what we think of as kind of open monitoring where we're allowing our attention to go anywhere in the body, which could be that thing, <laughs> the, the skin patch that you were talking about, um, versus guiding them into very specific things, which could be the heartbeat and 
And keep in mind that could be the thing that they're anxious about. Maybe, maybe it is the heart, right? So like we never know what, what's going through people's minds. And, and I think that can always be challenging because it is such a personal thing. So it's one of the reasons why at Yoga Medicine, we always recommend when there are really significant, whether that's an illness or a mental health issue or, or anything that they're working with a healthcare provider as well, so that we're understanding these things better. But, um, but yeah, I think those, those guided experiences can be a lot, um, I think more helpful in those instances, because then I am tuning into some of these things that tend to be, um, maybe just connected to, uh, an awareness of life in my body. And that can be an, an open awareness, like sense where I, I love this one too. In a, a yoga setting is like, notice where you feel this sense of life. Maybe that's your heartbeat. Maybe it's your breath. Maybe it's a vibration and now I can leave it open. And so there are definitely ways, um, there's always contraindications. I'm so glad you said that because there is, and, um, and it's definitely something to be conscious of when you're using these interceptive things. But in general, for the most part, it's such an important practice that most of us, I think, kind of like our vegetables can never quite get enough of, especially in our busy days. <laughs> and so a really, a really healthy dose of this can be really important for, for a lot of people. So, yeah. Um, and I didn't, I didn't want to, to scare anyone away from, from those practices. Definitely not, but I think it's, it's worth a mention. And what I also want to say, um, related to what you said, it's sometimes even just the listening, you don't even need an answer in your body. So you do not even need to feel the heaviness or the relaxation or the sense of being alive in your body. It's just the listening part of it will already improve that kind of communication quality between the nervous system and, and the brain in terms of interoception. So um, that I find fascinating too. You don't, you don't need results. You just need mm. the act of tuning in that's uh, going to be practice itself already. Exactly. I love that. And sometimes when we're scanning the body, I'll mention it as notice that a sense of of, of nothingness is also a sense, you know, a sense of feeling numb is also a sense. It's also an interpretation. It's also a feeling. So, um, yeah, I agree. I love that. I love that addition there. So interception, such a great one, <laughs> such an important one it requires a little bit kind of potentially maybe slower movements or more internal awareness versus a lot of the alignment focus, which can also be important for different things, but kind of sensing and feeling into the body, a, a sense of safety we talked about, which is really important. Um, and our ability to, to listen and observe without understanding, without interpreting, without the story, but to allow ourselves just to just to sense into and feel into such a powerful, such a precious thing. Um, and then I think one last thing we wanted to talk about was the, was the new Nobel prize. I think you wanted to mention a little bit on that too. Yeah. I just wanted to mention it because, um, the Nobel prize in 2021 in medicine has been awarded in the broader realm of sensory receptors too. Um, it has been awarded to David Julius and Artem Pataputian, and they have uh, done research on receptors for heat and also for touch. And that's related to what we've been talking about all episode long here. So that's why we wanted to include it. Mm, what we have to keep in mind, though, is we talked about nerve endings. So sensory nerve, the end of the nerve has a nerve ending, a receptor. And then those receptors that they have discovered, they are in the membranes, in the walls of those receptors we've been talking about. So for instance, um, some of those receptors, we call them piezo-1 and piezo-2, they have been found in the walls, in the membranes of the Golgi organs and of the muscle spindles. Um, and they kind of translate that mechanical input that the nerve ending gets so that it can be translated into an electrical signal that then travels up the sensory nerve towards the brain. 
And I think it's it's really cool that this part of the nervous system that we are also thinking about in our yoga practice, that we're thinking about in our movement practice when we consciously include the fascia, that this has made the Nobel Prize. It's just really cool. And um, that's why we wanted to include this here, because you may hear about it. And just to put it into context here. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, and I think it brings to life the the richness of this layer. Right? That there's there's all sorts of different receptors, and probably a lot more that we'll find out that we don't know just yet, and maybe that is happening within this fascial layer as well. And all of the details of you know exactly how to apply this, I think, is still to be a story to be told of exactly what all of this information means. But for now, that's a really good chunk of information to start with. We can sense that this fascial system is a is really this dense, rich, precious sensory organ, the largest sensory organ in the body, now, now even larger than the skin, um, for this kind of sense of whole body perception to be able to either sense that interoceptive awareness or the extraceptive awareness or the proprioceptive awareness, the nociceptive awareness. We have a lot of different types of, of receptors within the fascia that can respond to all these different rich environments, both within us and around us, and a lot of different ways that we can also support it. When getting up and moving, we know that just being immobilized is also <laughs> limiting and affecting that sensory collection of information, both in the gliding as well as in the, the tissues as, of the superficial fascia, movement, quick movements, slow movements, stretching, held movements. So for those of you watching on YouTube, you can see we have a little glitch. Luckily, it was right at the end of the episode here. So it was perfect timing. However, just to conclude the episode, we've, we've talked about a lot of different ways to stimulate the system, to really bring to life the richness of this really intricate sensory system and, and how important it is to the body to be able to collect a really rich picture, you know, like a few swipes on a canvas might be very different than seeing a beautiful Monet. So hopefully this inspires you and has given you some information to experiment with. Of course, like many of our episodes, if you want more information, you can dig around on our website. If you are a student and want more information on fascia or myofascia release, we have a nice short course. And if you're a teacher or someone with a really deep interest in working with the fascia, we have our whole full length myofascia release course that goes into a lot of detail around this tissue, the newer research around it, ideas of working with it, and tons, hundreds of techniques to be able to work with different parts of the body. So lots of resources for deeper study. Otherwise, I hope you have fun experimenting with the information that we've given you today. And we love hearing your comments and feedback. And I look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks for listening to Yoga Medicine. If you like the show, please be sure to subscribe and leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you got something out of this episode, please spread the word and share it with a friend. You can find more information, articles, trainings, and classes at yogamedicine.com or check us out on social media as Yoga Medicine. You can also email us at info at yogamedicine.com. Thank you for being a part of our Yoga Medicine community. We look forward to seeing you again. The content of this podcast is not medical advice and is not meant to replace medical care. Please consult your healthcare provider to determine what is best for your unique healthcare needs.